Dale's work to transform Virginia away from Jamestown didn't end with his 1616 departure. In fact, while he, Rolf, Pocahontas, and her retinue were in England, the Virginia Company debated their next moves. Dale showed off Rolf's tobacco offering and promised that more, better tobacco was being produced on the newly established plantations up the James River. Discussions centered on this point especially because the company simply had nothing to offer investors in return for their decades' worth of work in Virginia. But in theory, they had land to offer, land upon which to grow a potential cash crop. There was one major problem, however. King James detested tobacco. In spite of the king's tobacco hatred, Virginia grew. It grew based upon one major concept that might seem so simple to a modern American. The Introduction of Private Property Tis the gift to be simple Tis the gift to be free Tis the gift to come down to King James' tobacco hatred was well known, especially because he published one of the earliest anti-tobacco treatises entitled A Counterblast to Tobacco. James' 1604 diatribe hammers the filthy novelty's vile odor and damaging health effects. But the king realized that he'd not be able to keep the weed out of his realm. Because of this realization, he authorized Thomas Sackville to levy an excise tax and tariff of six shillings, eight pence per pound, or as much as one pound sterling per three pounds of tobacco imported into England. Perhaps this measure would slow tobacco's influx while allowing the crown to make some money in the process. The tax was one thing, but the tariff was meant to destroy Spain's ability to sell the weed in England while they received English currency in exchange. The situation was a big no-no for the mercantilist-minded era. But the tariff wasn't only meant to hurt the Spanish, it was also meant to retain some money in the royal coffers. Regardless of their intent, the measures greatly increased the price of tobacco in England as a result. It was for this reason that men like John Rolfe began looking for alternatives to grow and sell tobacco, and they realized England's demand was a potential for a wealthy business venture. When early growth experiments seemed to be positive, Dale and Rolfe had to share their findings to the teetering Virginia Company. At first, however, the company was reluctant, but their opinions began to change when one of England's chief opponents of monopoly, Edwin Sandus, brother of Thomas Sandus, a starving time survivor, became one of the Virginia Company's directors. Sandus had been involved prior to 1616, but he wasn't part of Thomas Smythe's inner circle of Virginia Company directors mostly due to his anti-monopolistic stance. Even so, Sandus' governmental work largely helped to keep the Virginia Company alive past 1609. Rolfe met with Sandus and presented him with the 1616 land survey that detailed Virginia's main settlements up until that point. While presenting his work to Sandus, Rolfe highlighted the need for more settlers. Many more, in fact. Thomas Dale agreed and added that he asked for 2,000 settlers back in 1612, and that he didn't get them. Such requests like Thomas Dale's had continuously been disregarded, as Virginia was not seen as a place of economic growth per se. It was regarded more as an outpost that would feed and support England. That being the case, the Virginia Company's administrative culture had to change, and Sandus wisely saw an opportunity after perusing Rolfe's survey. He could change the culture, increase English power, and make money. But so too could many others because Virginia had one major commodity to offer the people for whom men like Sandus represented. Land. Lots of it. And on it, the land-deprived, nicotine-addicted English could grow tobacco for home consumption, which would also bypass Sackville's tariff, thus reducing the overall cost to smoke the weed. Further, 
Obtaining tobacco from Virginia would also serve to undercut the Spanish domination of the weed, allowing for more English gold to stay in England. A major win for a mercantilistic mindset. It seemed to be a sound business model made all the more attractive, in contrast to the Virginia Company's decade of failure. Sandus proposed the company could do as it had done with Bermuda and begin selling land to investors. These investors would then supply and ship settlers across the Atlantic in order to populate their purchases. In the short period that this scheme was employed in Bermuda, the former Devil's Isles had become prosperous in a way that Virginia could only dream of. Further, the Bermuda settlers were surviving, and in fact had double the population of 1616 Virginia, even though relatively fewer had emigrated to the island colony since 1612. The business proposal was accepted, and thus a new wave of settlements and plantations along the James River after 1616 began. These new settlements would not be constructed under Thomas Dale's authority, however. Rolfe returned, sadly without his wife and son, and though he had greatly elevated his worth, he also would not be chosen to oversee the company's new plans. Instead, Samuel Argall, the man who approximately seven years prior had become famous for his newly navigated Atlantic crossing route, Powhatan Scourge, and Pocahontas co-kidnapper, had risen to the lieutenant governor's chair. It'd be he who governed Virginia's new plantation system, and he began it by apparently focusing his attention back down the James River to an area just north of the original settlement in 1617. The settlement Argall founded was known as Paspahegue Country. It spread out over 3,000 acres south of the Chickahominy River, extended northward from Jamestown, and centered upon Argall Town, and later upon Paspahegue. Argall Town was essentially the governor's land, and was to be established as such. But when Argall organized workers on the plot of land, they not only built structures and tended the land, they also established and populated a growing community. Argall only encouraged more settlement at Argall Town when he hired colonists from the nearby Martin's Hundred to clear 600 acres of woodland and then have a house built for himself on that land. At first, Argall took advantage of the colonists and passed the cost of their work onto the very colonists doing the work. The workers balked, news spread of Argall's scheme, and he had to find a new plan to encourage the work to be completed. As an enticement, Argall and his newly appointed captain of the governor's company and guard, William Powell, offered houses and land to the Martins' hundred workers. By 1619, those workers had indeed established themselves at their new homes and seemingly became quite prosperous. But Argall's involvement in the venture was not to last. Captain Argall had certainly overseen Virginia's best period to date, as products were shipped to England including 20,000 pounds of tobacco in 1618. The settlers had finally seemed to be able to provide for themselves. The captain even saw some of the first major plantations begin official settlement, such as Smith's Hundred and Martin's Brandon. Further, Jamestown, which had suffered great disrepair under Thomas Dale's neglect, was rebuilt by Argall. Granted, much of the newly found prosperity had more to do with Thomas Dale's introduction of some private property than it did with anything that Samuel Argall might have accomplished. Regardless, the infant private property scheme that Dale had begun had a huge impact in that it encouraged individuals to support themselves instead of relying upon the constantly drained company storehouse. No matter who was responsible for the new prosperity, the potential that Argall was taking advantage of the company for his personal benefit could not be neglected. Word of Argall's actions north of Jamestown, as well as other similar commands throughout Virginia, made its way back to the company and Lord Delaware, who in 1618 embarked on a journey to investigate his lieutenant governor. But Delaware never made it. He died at sea, and George Yardley was chosen to be next in line for the governorship. Yardley had been with the Virginia Venture since 1609, and was one of the Sea Venture shipwreck survivors. He was also, like so many other early Virginia leaders, a veteran of the war between the Spanish and the Dutch. As such, he was trusted by many, especially Thomas Gates, who elected Yardley to be the captain of his personal bodyguard. 
Later, Dale chose Yardley to serve as deputy governor when he and Argall traveled back to England in 1616. While deputy governor, Yardley famously negotiated a peace treaty with the Chickahominy tribe that allowed the English and the Indians to freely trade together once again. That deputy governorship officially ended with Argall's return, but Yardley still enjoyed a measure of power as he remained close to Argall, and even later named one of his sons Argall in honor of the outgoing captain. But Yardley was not close to just colonial leaders, he also had strong English connections as well. In 1618, just before Yardley became Virginia's next governor, he was at home in England where he married Temperance Flowerdew, herself a survivor of the starving time, whose family was also quite prominent in the Virginia settlement. Also while at home, King James knighted Yardley at Newmarket in November 1618, thus putting the royal stamp of approval on the incoming governor. The company leaders gave Yardley specific instructions concerning how to institute a new land policy, a policy that quite drastically changed the colony's course from that moment onward. First, four 3,000-acre plots of land were set aside for company use in four formally established cities, Henrico, Charles City, James City, and Elizabeth City, the former Kekatan. In conjunction with this setup, the company gave a further 10,000 acres to Henrico, which were to be used to establish a college at which Indians and young colonists could be trained. Next, the company recognized plantation work already being done by men such as Argall, Yardley, and Martin. Yardley also benefited from this recognition in that he was given an approximately 2,000-acre plot of land that juts southward into the James River and is today known as Wyanoak. Finally, Sandus reasoned that every settler would generate around 1,000 pounds of profit each year. Therefore, in a couple of years, the company's 50,000-pound debt would be repaid, and everyone would finally start making money. That meant the company now had to attract settlers. The Great Charter of 1618, as Yardley's instructions have been known to history, stipulated that those who traveled to Virginia before Thomas Dale left in 1616 would receive 100 acres of land. Further, if any of those settlers had invested into the company, they'd receive an additional 100 acres of land per 12 pound, 10 shilling share purchased. For those who came after 1616, the famous headright system was put into place in which a settler who paid his own way would receive 50 acres of land. They could also receive additional 50-acre plots for each settler that was shipped to Virginia at the settler's cost. This system was so novel that it governed how Virginia was settled for at least the next century. Bottom line, Virginia had land, and a lot of it in theory. That land could be profitable for the individuals and the company alike, but the company needed people to work the land in order to turn that profit. Thus, the historically groundbreaking directive to Yardley. Upon assumption of his new post at Jamestown, George Yardley instituted rent upon the settlers at Argalltown, claiming that the land belonged to the governor of the colony and that they'd wrongfully settled the town. Yardley then moved to reestablish Argalltown and called it Paspahegio in reference to the fact that the land was supposedly purchased from the former inhabitants of the region around Jamestown. In addition to the settlement at Argalltown, Five other plantations were undertaken between 1617 and 1618. Smith's Hundred, Tanks Wyanoke, Flowerdew Hundred, Mulberry Island, and Martin's Hundred. In 1617, the Society of Smith's Hundred founded one of the earliest particular plantations as they were known, after more than 80,000 acres of land were granted in Thomas Smith's name. The plantation spanned the James River's northern bank, moving northward from the Chickahominy River and into the outer edges of Wyanoak lands, where today's Renwood Farms is located. The first wave of settlers arrived a few months after the original land grant and seemed to have started their work by creating bricks and establishing a mill for making tools. George Yardley himself took an interest in the plantation after he arrived. He even had money invested in the work, which serves to later illustrate just why Yardley would ask for more settlers to be sent at his expense in 1619. He was also involved in obtaining livestock as well as plows for which to work the land. But he seems to have been resigned to just being able to produce corn on the land as tobacco never really took root. Yardley's interest is also clearly seen in that he built himself a house at Smith's Hundred and governed the colony from it while simultaneously administrating the plantation. At first, Smith's Hundred led Virginia's production boom. 
But disease took a toll, as well as the newly arriving settlers giving up on their attempt to produce iron in exchange for growing tobacco. Regardless, the plantation persevered in many ways that others did not, especially in the interest of educating native as well as colonial children after the college at Henrico never really materialized. Tanks Wine Oak was also established on the peninsula that juts southward in the James River, just northward from Smith's Hundred. Today the peninsula is known simply as Wyanoke, but the formerly inhabiting Wyanoke tribe named this region Tanks, or Little Wyanoke, in distinction to the Great Wyanoke, which was located on the James River south side near the Appomattox River. Yardley was involved at the outset in that 2,200 acres of land were given to him first by Opie Cancano, and then confirmed in the Virginia Company's 1618 instructions to the incoming governor. But not much action seems to have taken place here before 1622, other than initial land clearing. Yardley certainly benefited from this property, however, in that he sold it to Abraham Piercy for a nice profit by 1625. Tanks Wine Oak, as well as Smith's Hundred, were not the only properties Yardley was involved in. Yardley memorialized his marriage to Temperance Flowerdew not too long after returning to Virginia, and that he purchased a thousand acre plot of land directly across the river from Tanks Wine Oak on the James River southern shore, and named it Flower Dew Hundred. Perhaps because Yardley named this location after his wife, he felt the location worthy of his attention. Work quickly took shape in 1618, after which the plantation raised cattle and grew both tobacco and corn with some success. For instance, Flower Dew harvested 9,000 pounds of tobacco in 1624, and supplied 93 barrels of corn as well as 1,600 pounds of fish to the colony. It was certainly one of Virginia's leading plantations in that it also boasted 12 houses, three storage facilities, four tobacco houses, two boats, and the first windmill built in Virginia on the peninsula still bearing its name, Windmill Point. Evidently, Yardley prized this location before he sold it to Abraham Piercy in 1624. Because Yardley provided guns, powder, swords, and armor to the plantation's earliest settlers in order to be used in case of an attack. This supply would prove necessary as it aided the plantation well in 1622, as we will later see. Another potential 1617 settlement may have been undertaken at Mulberry Island, southeast of Jamestown, where present-day Fort Eustace is located. The island had been known to the earliest Jamestown settlers, and was in fact the location where Thomas Gates met and was turned around by Lord Delaware in 1610. Settlers named the island Mulberry Island sometime before 1614 because of the abundance of native mulberry trees growing there. It was also one of the locations that John Rolfe used to cultivate his earliest tobacco production. By 1617, Captain William Pierce, the captain of the guard at Jamestown, had patented 650 acres on the island and came to work the land before he moved into a new home after March 1622. Last, but certainly not least in this list of early particular plantations, was the profoundly vibrant Martin's Hundred, named for and established by Richard Martin. Many view Martin's Hundred as the leading example by which other plantations plan their settlements. Martin himself was aided by one Sir John Wollstenholme, who was honored to have the plantation's leading town named after him, Wollstenholme Town. The plantation occupied 80,000 acres and stretched for five miles in a bend along the southern James River, directly east from Jamestown and directly north of Mulberry Island. 280 colonists, who first occupied the land grant, arrived in 1618, and additional groups came by subsequent migratory waves every year thereafter until 1622. These settlers, as historian Charles Hatch states, were a determined lot. They quickly built a church, rows of houses, and established farms in a short period of time. They were so successful that many, such as Captain Argall, took advantage of the workers and work being done on Martin's Hundred throughout her establishment. Prosperity also seemed to be a problem for the Martin's Hundred settlers, because as their numbers grew, so too did the land claims being made by the newly arriving colonists. Yardley wasn't sure how to handle the growing issue, but he seemed content enough by 1621 in that he wrote about the Society of Martin's Hundreds potentially purchasing land along the Kiskiak, that is the York, River. That all came to naught, however, in March 1622 when Martin's Hundred and Wollstone Hometown, as well as many of the James River plantations, suffered greatly by the hands of an unexpected Indian raid. 
Yet before that raid, more than 8,000 settlers made their way up the James River and transformed the failing Virginia colony into a firmly established and somewhat profitable settlement. Thank you again for supporting the podcast. It's greatly appreciated. Please continue to spread the word and help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider, like us on Facebook, and visit the website. Sharing this and other episodes is the best way to expand the community. Another way to greatly aid the podcast is by providing feedback on iTunes. If you haven't done so yet, please take a few minutes and leave us a comment. Doing so helps bring exposure in the iTunes network. If you would like to do more, please consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. Links can be found on the website, or one can visit the campaign at patreon.com forward slash vahispod to see the choices and rewards being offered. Please join me next time as I continue outlining the growth of the historic James River plantations up to the infamous 1622 Opecancano raid, as well as introduce two new types of settlers who had a massive influence, not only on Virginia, but the rest of English America. Do do bad, do 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 do